Hey, how's it going? PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Do you remember this game? I certainly do. I thought it was okay when it first came out, but I've really learned to appreciate it over the years. The thing is though, recently, a user by the name of Kudiatsu, who's actually a Beta64 fan, reached out to me saying that she found a never-before-seen prototype of the game called Title Fight. She sent me hours of footage, and honestly, there's a lot to show you. I also reached out to developers of the original game to explain why exactly the company went defunct and what happened behind the scenes. There's so much info to cover here, so much stuff that has never before been known to the public. And I'm happy to bring it all to you today on this episode of Beta 64 on PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. At the very beginning of development, when PSASBR was just an idea on paper, Naughty Dog was approached with the idea by the game's future publisher, Sony Computer Entertainment. But it wasn't quite the same concept as the game became. At that time, the Battle Royale aspect of the game hadn't been decided on. Though, you know, Battle Royale means something very different than just fighting game nowadays. Basically, all Sony told Naughty Dog was that they wanted their game to feature a bunch of PlayStation mascots, and Naughty Dog politely declined. After all, they were in the middle of developing another game, The Last of Us, you might have heard of it. There was really no one free to handle a project like that, so Sony went on to find someone else. Though, instead of looking for that someone else, they decided to make them, a new company called Broodworks. This was around 2009, three years before the game eventually released. This new group of game devs was formed in Culver City, California by Shannon Studstill and Chan Park, who both worked for Sony Santa Monica, which is known for internally developing the God of War series and doing collaborative development with a bunch of other popular games like Journey. A year or so later though, Studstill decided to leave Broodworks, and around that same time, the company was renamed Superbot Entertainment for reasons. So yeah, they were already one person down, but not to worry, because Omar Kendall was asked to join the team. Previously the creative director of other fighting games like UFC Undisputed 2009 and 10, he already had fighting game experience and would be perfect as the director of Superbot's new project. Except at first it wasn't really a fighting game exclusively. Before they settled on that 4 player brawler gameplay, they were playing on doing a 4v4 capture the flag style game where each character would be sorted by classes on speed, power, etc. Players would pick their character and be placed on one of two teams whose goal was to, well, capture the flag and get it to their base. We had Parappa the Rappa as the speedy running type, Sweet Tooth as the base's defender, and Kratos, well, he was the best of both worlds, chilling it out and taking it slow as a mid-range attacker. This style of gameplay went as far as to get its own playable prototype, but everything changed once the team decided they wanted the game to utilize only a single screen instead of having sprawling multi-screen stages. The reason? Simply put, they wanted to have all four players looking at the same thing at the same time in the same room. And to fulfill that wish, they chose to make the game a four-player brawler. Around this time, Superbot made a pitch to Sony in the form of a trailer. Normally we wouldn't get to see this, but at the PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale panel at Comic-Con 2012, they showed off some of the early stuff, including the pitch that got Sony to greenlight the game with Superbot at the helm. This trailer showcased a lot of the earlier ideas of the game with the sprawling multi-screen platforming levels, but also had the fighting deathmatch style that they just recently decided to go along with. So without further ado, let's see what this trailer's got. In this trailer, four characters were given the spotlight. Kratos, Parappa, Fat Princess, and Sweet Tooth, with their goal being to beat each other up on stages out of Uncharted and God of War. Though the Uncharted 2 train stage was the one that got the most screen time. That stage even showcased a mashup with Warhawk, meaning that the idea of putting two games on the same stage was already planned at this point. I think you can even make out some pat upon peeps in the background of the God of War stage. Right there. From a developer interview years later, it turns out that Train Stage in particular was from an even earlier time in development, back when the game was using that Capture the Flag style gameplay. That would explain the large amount of platforming in these stages, especially the God of War one. Speaking of that, there's a reason why it was only briefly showcased in this trailer. You see that? Those are placeholder blocks. Wouldn't want Sony to see too much of that. But despite these large platforming based stages, according to the UI shown for just a split second, this version was meant to be a fighting deathmatch style game, just running on the old stage design. That UI also poses an interesting question. Why are there two bars? In the final game, there's only one bar for AP and the number of what super level you've worked up to. In the pitch, it seems like the bottom meter is for AP, since it has the number 01 beside it for supers. But if that's the case, what's the other bar for? Well, this UI isn't shown anywhere else in the trailer, so we can't be entirely sure. Some say it's a life bar, which could make sense. But from various interviews with developers, it seems Omar Kendall never wanted to use health points in this game. 
Apparently, there was a lot of back and forth discussion about this, some wanting it to at least be made into a separate mode, but eventually they all agreed just to scrap the idea in order to avoid distractions and to keep the fanbase from being divided on different playstyles. For this trailer specifically though, maybe it was an HP meter that was added in simply just as a, we might put this in later kind of thing. It would make sense, especially at this point in development, since the team wasn't yet in total agreement of whether or not to include it. At the end of this cinematic adventure, we're given the game's placeholder title, Title Fight, which was chosen specifically because it had a placeholder-like ring to it. I mean, it has title right in the name, and that was intentionally done because the team wanted it to look so unfinished that onlookers wouldn't get attached to the name and they could freely change it later without upsetting fans. But it still upset fans, so that didn't quite work. Now in late 2010, with the game finally greenlit by Sony as a free-for-all brawler, Superbot began the job search, hiring people who had previous experiences developing these kinds of fighting games. The thing is though, the job search unintentionally leaked some info about their game. The listing said, and I quote, We are an exclusive developer for Sony Computer Entertainment America, and are currently in production of a yet-to-be-announced PS3 title. That's not so bad, right? At least it wasn't anything specific until you keep reading down where it says they were looking for those who were good at taking directions from design leads to create AI characters within a combat-heavy game. And they were also looking for those with a strong familiarity with online mode and matchmaking design as they applied to console gaming. So basically from the get-go, the public knew that Superbot's first game was going to be a multiplayer fighting game with online matchmaking, and new sources like Eurogamer were happy to report on that. Still. To be honest, that's not so bad. The whole Sony crossover aspect was still well hidden away. That is, until a few months later, when a couple of images got leaked. This time of the actual game. The first one was of Sweet Tooth, which was actually posted by a random Twitter account weeks before this little site known as Paul Gale Network picked it up and brought it to everyone's attention. Along with another image of... this. I know it doesn't seem like much, but if you direct your attention down here, you'll notice it says Kratos on the bottom and all of this was listed as title fight screenshots and posted on November 4th, 2011. Paul Gill Network was far from done though. He somehow managed to get into contact with someone who played an early version of the game and used that opportunity to leak tons of info. To this day, developers on the team don't know for sure who did this and how it all happened. But the general consensus seems to be that Paul Gale got the info from a player who participated in a focus test set up by Superbot. That leak managed to successfully predict some of the game's characters like Parappa, Kratos, Sly Cooper, Nathan Drake, Sweet Tooth, Colonel Radek, and Fat Princess. It also revealed the game's controls and the inclusion of James Bond 007, the guy. Yeah, no, that is literally what it said. At that time, there was a rumor going around that James Bond would be included in the game's roster, and Paul Gale definitely made it seem like there was an attempt to get Mr. 007 on board. Turns out, he was completely wrong. James Bond was never considered by the team. You know who they did consider though? Snake. Mr. Solid Snake himself was considered to be in title fight, but that didn't happen actually. They got Raiden instead because Revengeance was set to be released soon. You know what's sad? Superbot really did try their best to get some classic well-known characters in their game like Crash, Spyro, Snake, etc. But negotiations always fell through. It's like, if you've ever played the game and thought, man, I wish there was more classic Sony mascots in it, well, it really wasn't their fault. They didn't have a whole lot to work with. Devin Morrow worked on Sir Daniel's design and he recounted in an interview that while there were a lot of really cool, amazing characters in their brainstorm sessions that they had listed out, it just all fell through. Either there was a convoluted story of it just wouldn't work, or there was other times where a reboot was right around the corner and they wanted to wait for that before they put the character in the game otherwise known as Laura Croft. Honestly, for a company full of Sony fans, Devin called it soul crushing. There's one more thing I want to mention about the Paul Gale leak, and that's Lair. You know that game made by Factor 5 that caused Sony to cut off ties with the company and they never released a game again? Yeah, that Lair. In the leak, it mentioned that Superbot was going to add in a Lair stage, complete with dragons and fire and battles, and you could even ride one of the dragons to burninate the other fighters. Turns out though, that was all made up. Yeah, all of it. A former developer at Superbot let me know that that stage was never implemented or planned at any point in development, which is why there isn't a single reference to Lair in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, because there was never planned to be one. Now, 24 hours after the semi-leak dropped about the fake stage and other such things, a build of Title Fight was made at Superbot, 
specifically on December 7, 2011, a little less than a year before the game's release. And of course, like hundreds of bills before it, it was lost to the sands of time. Or so we thought. On June 15, 2019, Kuriatsu, a Beta 64 fan actually, unknowingly found it hidden away on a debug PS3 she purchased on eBay. While the build is buggy and it crashes like crazy, it's beautiful. There's just mountains of changes in this thing. There's too many changes for me to even get close to getting through in this video. So after watching this episode, I'm going to link you over to Kudiatsu's 13 part series on the prototype build of Title Fight. It'll be releasing over time, so be sure to check out her channel every so often for literally several hours of comparisons. In order to give you a, a taste of what's in this prototype though, I'm going to show you some of the most interesting finds in this early build of PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Now before we start comparing all of this, there's one thing that's going to be showing up every single time, and that's the debug menu. If you press select anywhere in the game, it will pause it and bring up this glorious menu full of different wonderful options like debug camera, level select, character menu, AI, physics, tracking, sounds, networking, and motion controls. Believe it or not, in this build of Title Fight, there are motion controller settings for PlayStation Move. If you turn it on, point it towards the camera, it makes this little red box appear. It's, uh, it's not much, but it does show that motion controls may have originally been planned to be in the final version of the game if they went to all this trouble to get it to work. There's also one more thing that I want to show that I just love busting out at parties. It's under the effects menu called uh, Playtest Movie. What do you think? First off, the most notable difference, the title screen. Obviously, since the game was going to be called Title Fight at that point and not PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, the logo changed. And it's also accompanied with a completely different title theme. Now, normally I'd say, take a listen, and then it would play the song, but here's the thing, in this prototype, they use a lot of actual, like, songs. They didn't have the time yet to compose new music, so they just pulled random songs that they liked. And for the sake of not being claimed, I'm just going to tell you what the song is. It's called Stress by Justice. Let's just press start and head over to the main menu, where lo and behold, it again looks completely different. Seems stats would have originally been front and center to the player, allowing them to use the L1 and R1 buttons to cycle through the stats for each character. There's also a whole nother menu dedicated to even more of these stats, but it's either dummy data or sometimes just plain blank. There's also an unfinished ticker that would have displayed what you and other users were up to at any given time, and a feed that would have kept players up to date on, well, updates. On this screen, the player would have been able to read developer posts like change logs, season details, and plan special events. But in the final game, we only got like this, just the number of days left in a season and a leaderboard. Also, you may have noticed that the tournament mode appears to be missing from this build, but it actually turns out it's underneath the versus tab which to be honest, feels pretty cluttered. So moving the online functionality into its own little area was definitely a smart move. Now, of course, this online functionality isn't working. The servers it would have attached to are long gone. But if you do connect your system online and log into your PlayStation Network account on the character selection screen, it'll actually grab your username and attach it to your character. Now you can do the same thing in the final version by logging in with this option down here. But in the early build, you just simply press R2 to log in. And you know, since we're here on the character select screen already, let's take a look at the different UI, especially the playable characters they have listed here. There are definitely some characters here that aren't in the final game. And heck, even the ones that did make it into the final have different portraits and even some full body renders such as, but not limited to, Deadeye Spike and Chonky Parappa. Though, that one's not just the character portrait. Apparently he's a chonk in the game too, much like in the pitch trailer to Sony. If we look at some actual Parappa games, you'll notice he's a lot flatter. And thankfully his model in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale was fixed up before released. But going back to that character selection screen, are we missing some people? Well, actually Cole is in this build of title fight, but for some reason his portrait is a placeholder for Kluche from Loco Roco. Rest assured though, selecting this dude will give you Cole. A very, very unfinished Cole. Most of his attacks don't have any effects to them and feature blocky placeholder models. Not to mention his animations are kind of fricked up. Ow. Turns out, as you probably expected, a lot of the selectable characters in this build are unfinished, like Jack and Daxter, who carry untextured guns that fire invisible bullets. Or what about Toto, who sometimes doesn't even show up on the screen until you use a move that changes your outfit? 
And even then, these are some rough, untextured outfits. Sir Daniel even takes that a step further and doesn't load in the game at all, even if he is one of the selectable icons. Now we do have some character porches here that we can't select, like Blastos, Dr. Nefarious, Buzz, a Doberman from Sly Cooper, a Excuidin, Uikaden. One second. Gonna show you how to get on to these rooftops. You need a Eucadian plane. Eucadian! A Eucadian and Chernovian soldier, both from Warhawk. None of these portraits are selectable, and the reason why, as revealed in a developer interview, is that these are all placeholders. Yeah, if you look online, you'll see a lot of these mock-up UIs. A lot of them have different characters that weren't in PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale, and it turns out they're all placeholders. They weren't meant to be playable in the game. Well, except two. Buzz and the Eucadian Soldier, both of which are still in this build of the game as fighters. Though, I wouldn't say they're playable in any way. Here's what I mean by that. The Eucadian Soldier, for instance, can be spawned in by going into the debug menu. All you do is go to level menu and then you can select what level you want, as well as how many characters, what characters, and you know, what team they're on. You can select the character to be Eucadian. And if we select them all to be Eucadian, surely it'll show up in the game. So the good news is it doesn't crash. Bad news is there's nobody here. The thing is though, if we go into the inspect objects menu, we can check to see if he actually spawned in the game, and lo and behold, he did. At 000, which is never a good sign. It turns out this is an empty object, filled with other empty objects like spawning objects and sounds, but there's no sounds. So honestly, in the end, he's just an empty object. When asked about this, a developer at Superbot mentioned that by this point, the soldier hadn't been worked on for so long that it was completely out of date and probably was only left as an option because dependencies made it difficult to delete. Apparently he was one of the first four or so characters designed for the game and had a semi-complete moveset featuring jetpack flying and a move that basically made him a human torpedo. But sadly, none of that works in this build. Poor guy. Not all hope is lost though. Kuriatsu is actually currently data mining the game to try and find his files and has already found some of his weapons and moves. But I'll let her show that off in her own channel. Instead, let's move on to Buzz, who's in this prototype as an actual functional fighter. But he's not playable. He spawns midway through a match on the Dreamscape stage as a computer controlled character and immediately goes to attack the player. If he's defeated, he'll drop a Buzz controller, which when picked up, changes the stage to be Buzz themed. Now you may remember in the final game that the Dreamscape stage also changes to a Buzz theme near the end of the match, but that's all involuntary. No need to defeat Buzz as an enemy, no need to pick up a Buzz controller, it just happens on its own. And this is the same for every other stage mashup in the final game. That leads us to an interesting point. In this prototype of title fight, for any stage mashup to occur, you have to collect an object. Some require you to defeat a character from the game like with Hotshot Golf, but with some game changers as they're called by fans, they just spawn on their own to collect. Why were they removed? Well, a developer mentioned in an interview that it had some strange effects on match length, since it could be picked up at any time. So in order to make development easier, they just decided to make the transition automatic at the same time, every time. You know, since we were already talking about Buzz in the Dreamscape stage, let's talk about the stage itself and see what differences are here. Though, honestly, there isn't really a whole lot to talk about besides improved visual effects. Other than that, the most obvious change here is that the clouds were replaced with simple platforms in the final game. But there are some more subtle changes here too. Like how if you miss Buzz's question, you actually die by Pi, instead of just being knocked around and losing AP. Another subtle change you'll find in this stage happens when it places the big center block. Turns out if you're inside it while it's being placed, instead of being lifted gently to the top like in the final game, you're blasted to the side instead. Also, this poison water here? Yeah, it actually kills you in the prototype. It's very rare in the final game for any stage to actually kill the player, but in this early build, a lot of things kill you, including items. The rocket launcher, for instance, is an insta-kill on this build, instead of it just causing a huge knockback and throwing a bunch of AP orbs. They did this because it was hard to develop interesting items and keeping them balanced. Basically, if this item insta-kills, what could possibly be better? Why bother with anything else? That was their opinion on it, so the idea was scrapped. Looking back at the Dreamscape stage, it turns out it wasn't always a Little Big Planet 1 art style. Turns out even before this build was made, there was some early concept art drawn up of the stage, and it turns out it would have looked very different. 
This original piece of concept art seems to be based off of Eve's Asylum from Little Big Planet 2, complete with bounce pads, fire, and even some little nods to Little Big Planet 1 with the house and clouds. But despite how different it looks, that tree in the center is still there. Turns out that tree is in every single piece of concept art we have of this stage, including this one, which is much closer to the final design, but it seems to have a lot more props on the stage like Humpty and the king with his castle. Oh, and hey look, it's Buzz. Seems like they were playing the stage mashup from way, way early on. This same design was kept for some later concept art too. And a fun little fact, a crop version of this image is used as the stage selection image for Dreamscape in this early build. Same for the other stages too. They all use early concept art for their thumbnails. Just an interesting fact. Oh, by the way, there's also another version of this Dreamscape stage in this build called Dreamscape Trials, which is just the exact same stage, but with cakes lying around. Collecting them all does nothing, so that's great, and we're moving on. Next up is Alden's Tower, which I hope I'm pronouncing right, but I can't think of any other way to pronounce it. It has the same general format in the prototype as the final game, but opposite to Dreamscape, this stage is completely different in almost every other way. The background is different, the set pieces are different, the layout is different. Basically, the only similarities here are the following. It's a tower, it has the same general style, and it goes up. Oh, and it also has that Sly Cooper stage mashup on the top of the tower too, but it is far from finished. See, in this build, once the players reach the top, break the vault, one of them just has to grab this game changer of Sly Cooper's logo, and then BAM! Everyone's treated to a T-posing Sly Cooper with a gun. Or I guess more specifically, a glowing yellow gun with a giant white sphere as a reticle, shooting blue cubes at a red rectangle. Believe it or not, they didn't keep this T-posing style in the final game. I know, hard to believe. Instead, Sly Cooper was replaced with Carmelita Fox, and all those placeholder blocks were replaced with quality assets. Hades is up next, and this stage is pretty much the same as the final, except that big boy in the back's attack is simply a block, instead of a nice purple particle effect. Oh, and those little boys in the back? They changed too. See, in the retail build, when the Patapons fall into the background, they wait for a while before destroying Hades. But in this prototype, after you collect their flag, they walk in via cutscene. And Hades? Well, he just decides to head to Chipotle or something. Now, here's a place that changed quite a bit. Invasion based on the Killzone series. Now, this stage has a few phases in the final. First, you're soaring through the sky in a couple of big flying machines. And next, you're dropped off on a bridge that gets destroyed over time. And lastly, right before the halfway point of the match, this big robo named Goliath from Ape Escape comes out to play, shooting tons of missiles at the stage. And you know, if he's feeling like it, maybe some death claps. In this early build of Title Fight though, you don't start at Phase 1, instead you start in a hangar, which I'll call Phase 0. This little space room you're in is then attacked, and starts dropping through the atmosphere of the planet. At least that's what I'm gonna assume, since it looks like those red rectangles are supposed to represent fire. The boom! The ships take off, starting with 2 and then upping its count to 5. Though in the final, you'll only ever get 2 big ships, probably to keep there from being a massive amount of jumps involved. Next, you'll fall into that bridge from the final, which looks the same, but it's already broken from the start. Oh, and look, it's freaking Buzz again. Here, he's only being used as a temporary game changer. When defeated, you'd know this. He grabs his remote and then starts the stage mashup. This time with the Ape Escape giant robo. That is unfinished. Mm -hmm. This uh, blocky dude shoots uh, lasers at the stage instead of missiles like the retail build, and then it just floats there endlessly. At least until the match is over, and then it's finally free from his mortal coil. Sandover Village. Remember this Jack and Daxter inspired stage? Well, it's also in this early build, and it's definitely one of the more complete stages it has to offer. Comparing it to the final, it's almost the same except for a few minor differences. Like how the intro's cutscene movement focuses on the entire map in the proto, but just this house here in the final. You also have to fight this hotshot golf lady in order to start the stage mashup with hotshot golf. But here's the thing, in this retail version of the game, when the mashup begins, which of course is automatic, this time gate activates, sucking stuff from the stage and then shooting out golf carts, flags, golfers, and a nice sign before disappearing completely. In this prototype, however, the same time gate never turns on, never disappears, and never shoots out anything. Though Samos and Kiera do disappear during the mashup transition, so it was probably planned to be implemented at a later point in development. Oh, one last thing, dying. When you get eaten by Defishi in the early build, you respawn a few seconds later, as if you were decimated by a super. In the final though, you just respawn all dizzy and unable to move, allowing other fighters to get a few extra hits in. Turns out, like the Dreamscape stage, Sandover Village also has a trial version, and once again, your task is to collect cake. 
but that's not going to be easy because one of those slices is unreachable. If you turn on the debug camera and look all the way to the left, you'll find this lone slice of cake outside of play. And thanks to an invisible wall, you can't grab it. This group of almost completed stages includes another familiar area, Metropolis from the Ratchet and Clank series, which is pretty much the same as the final version except the stage changes are in a different order. Like the conveyor belt moving, the center platform lifting, the crates appearing, etc, etc, it's all out of order in this early build. That center platform raising also reveals something different here, a hole of death that you can fall into instead of spinning spikes of doom that you can get shot out of. And one other thing that's super cute about this early version, whenever you die, you respawn in a taxi instead of just appearing on the stage. According to some players, this does happen in the final game too, but I've been playing version 1.00 of the game and the latest version for hours, and I haven't seen it once. Either way, it happens almost every time you die in this prototype, so if it is in the final version, it definitely appears a lot more frequently in this early build. Now, of course, this stage also has a game changer. To get it, you have to defeat this, what is that, a bird? Oh, it's, it's called a harpy. Okay, once you defeat the harpy, it drops the chest of Olympus. Grab it and the hydras appear. But here's a little interesting fact about this mashup. It turns out in the files of Metropolis in the prototype, there are many references to Hades himself. So perhaps Hades was originally going to appear at this stage as its mashup. And eventually, it transitioned into him getting his own stage. And that's all the stages we got. I mean, there is this test stage here, but it's not all that super interesting. I just wish that there were other stages, you know, outside the level select stages. I wish you could just open up the debug menu and select level select menu and then, and then pick a secret stage that's not available in the normal selection method. Something like maybe an early version of the stowaways. Man, that'd be cool. Uh oh. Remember the final version of Stowaways from Uncharted? The one where the back flies off the plane and you get to run around and fight as the songbird from Bioshock Infinite flies through the air? Well, it is in this build too, even if it's not on the selection screen. And as you can definitely tell right now, there's a reason why it wasn't included on that screen. It is very, very unfinished. The way the stage morphs throughout the match is the same as the final, starting with an incredibly small area and switching to a big open one, though a lot of the stage is made up of placeholder blocks. And guess what? Here's our friendly neighborhood Buzz here again, and picking up his controller, invokes the songbird to appear on the stage. Can you see it? It's the songbird. No, see, it totally, there's the body, there's the, uh, the wings. It's a, it's a dead ringer, if you ask me. Pilly. Another stage that's only reachable through the debug menu in the prototype. Its final version is a simple stage, really, consisting of only two platforms and what I believe is a water tower. Now here's the prototype. Eh. Nice. Honestly, it's pretty much exactly the same, just worse. And of course, why wouldn't it be? It's a prototype. And there's our pal Buzz again. And what does he bring us? Well, it should be the Negativitron bent on destroying all the happiness in the world. And you know what? Buzz does bring us that horror. Little, little unfinished, but compared to the Songbird, it's pretty good. It doesn't really do much though, but move up and down. But if you keep pressing R1 over and over again, it'll respawn them infinitely. That's pretty horrifying. It's here, it's here, it's finally here. November of 2012. Superbot's development team is excited for PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale's release, even if they did have to delay it about a month or so, but that's okay. That little delay allowed the team to really polish the game's look and feel based on the feedback they received from the public beta in October. At the launch party, it was poppin'. There was even talks from the producer of a possible sequel should the game perform well. And you know what? It actually did perform well. The sales weren't spectacular, but according to the numbers, it was enough to warrant a sequel should Sony give them the go-ahead. And they didn't. Despite selling enough copies needed to greenlight a sequel, and despite the fact that the game was one of the most played online games on the PS3 for the longest time, it wasn't enough in the eyes of big business. That's just how it is sometimes. It's, it's complicated. Reviews certainly didn't help either, with a lot of people giving the game a resounding meh. Many of them saw that supers were too unbalanced and really not that fun to use. In an interview, even Omar Kendall said that if he had the chance to redo it all over again, he probably wouldn't have added supers to begin with. He mentioned that far too often they became a low point in the game and were also very problematic from a gameplay perspective. And then something honestly really terrible happened. In January of 2013, Sony dropped Superbot. Completely. And despite what it said on Superbot's website about it ending on good terms, it was a rough transition. 
I've read from a lot of interviews that the people in the trenches felt betrayed, feeling that Sony didn't hold up their end of the bargain. Some wish they could have advertised it better, while others thought that Sony advertised it well enough, but they dropped the ball with helping get more classic characters in the game. Some even said they didn't help at all. It was just a crazy time for Superbot and it was devastating. They tried to recover by pitching projects to other companies like a fighting game to Capcom based on their game Rival Schools for the PS1, but nothing ever materialized and in 2014, they shut down their website and we never heard from Superbot again. But here's the thing, even though 2013 was the end of Superbot, it wasn't the end for PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Sony may have dropped Superbot, but they didn't drop the game. Yet. In 2013, Sony announced that they were now in charge of handling future DLC for the game. This was after Superbot had already released the DLC characters Cat from Gravity Rush and Emmett from Starhawk, along with the stage Fearless from Heavenly Sword. After that, Sony took the rest of their work and released a second pack later featuring Zeus from God of War and Isaac from Dead Space with the stage Graveyard from Medieval. There was even more DLC that Superbot had planned, like Abe from Oddworld and Dart from The Legend of Dragoon, but those were unfinished so Sony cut them, along with a new stage featuring Gravity Rush and Journey. Though for that stage, it was actually almost finished before Superbot was let go. At that point it was already playable, and a screenshot even leaked later on showing some of the stage. According to developers, it would have moved left to right, flipped upside down, and even shrunk over time because the sand from Journey would cause the building you were fighting on to sink, and thus restrict the playfield. According to those same developers, the team really liked that stage. Like, really liked it. And sadly, there's no way to play it today, and no videos even showing it in action. All we have are these screenshots that show what it would have looked like if things just turned out differently. Sony pulled the plug on PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale in September of 2018, shutting down its online services and washing their hands clean of their Sony crossover. Well, they actually, they did try again with it. Uh, PlayStation All-Stars Island. A game where you play as Nathan Drake trying to collect as many Coke droplets as possible. Sorry, Coke Zero. Taste the possibilities, not a sponsor. What a legacy you left behind. What a legacy. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Kudiatsu, Anonymous Devs, everyone who got involved, you all are amazing. Thank you to the patrons who are constantly supporting this show. And thank you viewers just for being here and giving it a good solid 30 minutes of your time. Now go pick up a copy of PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. I'll see you all later. Have a great day.